Hello YouTube, welcome back. I did not write a list of notes for today's video like I did the last two times. I was up pretty late last night writing an article. Um, the freelance videos are gonna come soon. I know I've been working on them for a month. I can't really remember when I started, but anyway. Okay, today we are covering a very exciting essay. However, okay, I do need to put in this content warning it covers some more mature topics. She writes pretty extensively about hard drugs, and these hard drugs are not legal to consume or possess. I'm not really sure on the legality of that. Probably, probably to both of those. I've let YouTube know that this video deals with sensitive issues already, so hopefully it's not showing up as recommended to younger viewers, but if it is, probably don't keep watching. If you really want to keep watching, get your parents' permission. Alright, so this week's essay is called Ecstasy, and in it, Gia discusses growing up in Houston, going to a megachurch called the Repentagon, and then later brings in her experience with ecstasy, Molly, MDMA, whatever you want to call it, um, and how it really strangely reflected what she viewed as the goal of attending church, of being faithful, um, was to her. So let's go through this chapter, see what I highlighted. It was a very interesting read. I really, really liked this essay. Also, the whole discussion about DJ Screw. So DJ Screw was a DJ in Houston who invented the style um, called Chopped and Screwed, which kind of reflected a lot of the drug culture that um, was rampant in the music scene in Houston at the time. So she writes it out in a pretty cool way. On page 137, she writes, Chopped and Screwed mimics the lean feeling, a heady and dissociative security as if you're moving very slowly toward a conclusion you don't need to understand. It induces a sense of permissive disorientation that melds perfectly to Houston. Chopped and Screwed picked up something about Houston that connects impurity to absolution. It was its own imaginary freeway, oozing with syrup, defining the city's limits, bounding it like the loop." So she writes a lot about um, the Repentagon and how Growing up, there were certain things that were acceptable, and there were certain things that were not. So there's this one part on page 139 where she writes, We had been taught that even French kissing was dangerous, that anything not marked by rich white Christianity was murky and perverse, but eventually it was the church that seemed corrupted to me. What had been forbidden began to feel earnest and clean. Okay, so another part I highlighted was on page 141, where she's at the end of high school and the beginning of college, and she's really struggling with her faith. So she kept a devotional journal. So one of the entries from it was, It's hard to draw the line between taking pleasure in God's purpose and aligning God's purpose with what I take pleasure in, I wrote. I stood between both sides of my life, holding the lines that led to them, trying to engage with a tension that I stopped being able to feel. Eventually, almost without realizing it, I let one side go. So then on page 143, she starts comparing religion and drugs. Um, she writes, Like many people before me, I found religion and drugs appealing for similar reasons. Both provide a path toward transcendence, a way of accessing an extra-human world of rapture and pardon that in both cases is as real as it feels. And then later on that page, she writes, Church never felt much more like virtue than drugs did, and drugs never felt much more sinful than church." Okay, so she does write a lot about her experience with ecstasy, but I'm more going to cover her reflections on it and comparing it to her experience with religion. So on page 148, she writes, "...I felt weightless, like I'd come back around to a truth I had first been taught in church, that anything could happen, and no matter what, a sort of grace that was both within you and outside you would pull you through. The nature of a revelation is that you don't have to re-experience it. You don't even have to believe whatever is revealed to hang on to it for as long as you want. In the 70s, researchers believed that MDMA treatment would be discreet and limited, that once you got the message, as they put it, you could hang up the phone. You would be better for having listened. You would be changed. 
they don't say this about religion, but they should. Then she includes a lot of quotes from how other people have described their experiences with both religion and ecstasy, and it does get kind of difficult to follow the more you go on, or at least I found it difficult to follow sometimes. Her closing was pretty cool though, so on page 153 she writes, I wonder if I would have stayed religious if I had grown up in a place other than Houston and a time other than now. I can't tell whether my inclination toward ecstasy is a sign that I still believe after all of this, or if it was only because of that ecstatic tendency that I ever believed at all. I wonder sometimes if I have continued to do drugs because they make me feel the way I did when I was little, an uncomplicated creation, vulnerable to guilt and benevolence." Ooh, okay. This is a cool part. So on page 150, <laughs> I feel like that's all I say, like, this is so cool, that's so cool. Okay, <laughs> I, I don't really know how book clubs are supposed to work. I just present what I thought was cool Sometimes I'll try to unpack it a little bit, but honestly, like, Gia's the expert on this, not me, so... Oh yeah, so the cool part. Okay, so page 154. I don't know if I'm after truth or hanging on to its dwindling half-life. I might only be hoping to remember that my ecstatic disposition is the source of the good in me. Spontaneity, devotion, sweetness, and the worst things too. Heedlessness, blankness, equivocation. Sunday in church isn't the same as Sunday on the radio. I'm trying to rid myself of the delusion that either type belongs to me. The sense of something is not its substance. Whoa. Okay, so now I'm remembering how this ties back into the rest of the book, because for a second I was like, whoa, what part of this is self-delusion again? Okay, that makes a lot more sense. So like, even though there are similarities between her experiences with religion and drugs, it is still a question of whether or not one of them is a true replacement for the other and which role each of them would be taking and whether that even matters. She writes on page 155, There are feelings like ecstasy that provide an unbreakable link between virtue and vice. You don't have to believe a revelation to hold on to it. Okay, so that concludes the parts that I highlighted in this chapter. Um, my battery's really close to dying right now, so I might have to wrap up the closing thoughts, but yeah, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, definitely let me know if you had any thoughts about this chapter or next week's chapter in the comments down below or in the Goodreads discussion page, um, which I'll also link down below. And yeah, alright, so next week's essay is about something that was pretty widely discussed in the YouTube communities. Um, I think it was either last year or a couple years back, the Fire Festival. Yeah, we're gonna get into that next week, so get excited. I'm definitely looking forward to that, and yeah, alright. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!